How do we bring healthcare disruption to the places and the people who need it most? So many of the new medical technologies we've been discussing here are designed to, ser to serve the 600 million people in the most developed countries in the world. But what about the other 6 billion? Uh, despite advances in vaccine design, production and distribution offering promise against global killers from AIDS to malaria, reaching people in developing nations still remains a challenge and a race against time. Here to discuss that, please welcome Dr. Seth Berkeley and Sir Andrew Witte with Fortune's Cliff Leaf. Someone just say a call to action? I love a call to action. So, we are in beautiful paradise here in, uh, in this extraordinary redoubt in, in San Diego. Um, and you know, we are the well taken care of in the world. Uh, we have the luxury of talking about disruption um, in, in, this, in this space. Uh, many people do not, and we would love to talk. We are privileged to have two people who have explored, uh, not only explored, but actually brought um, health innovation, disruption, and, and true care uh, to that other six billion that we're talking about. Uh, one of them, Seth Berkeley, has done it with a, uh, a essentially not for, for profit uh, consortium with, with public private partnership, sorry, um, called Gavi. And the other, uh, Sir Andrew Witte, has, has done it through GSK and uh, a public company and ch really changed the business model of that company. So, um, so the first thing I think would be important, let's just talk about Gavi for a second. What, what, explain to people what the business model is, because it's so interesting. So vaccines are, of course, one of the most powerful health technologies. And the challenge was we were innovating in vaccines, and they were going to wealthy populations, but weren't getting to the developing world where they were needed arguably even more. So Gavi was born as a public-private partnership at the World Economic Forum in 2000. And what it does is it works with the poorest countries in the world, the 73 poorest countries, by metric, so anything below a certain GNI. And what we do is we subsidize their vaccine purchases, but everybody pays something, which is one of the innovations. So if you're very poor, you pay 20 cents a dose. Why is that? It's not so much for the cost, it's to build you know, a sense of payment to build a line item in the Ministry of Finance. And then as the country gets wealthier, it pays more until eventually it crosses a threshold. And then um, within five years, it's fully self-financing. So, you know, that's one part of it. The second part of it is the, is the market shaping. We purchase vaccines for 60% of the world's kids. And as a result, we've been able to work with companies. I mean, we'll hear from GSK in a second, but we buy more than 70 million doses of vaccine a year from them and from other companies as well. And with that, we've been able to reduce the price point, but also bring new manufacturers into the market. That's been very important because what we want is a healthy marketplace with innovation going on, but we also want to make sure that prices do come down because it's so sensitive to countries being able to support that in the future. And lastly, we've innovated in, in using private sector mechanisms for delivery. Vaccines don't deliver themselves, so we spend 20 to 25 percent of our finance on strengthening health systems, building better data systems, building better supply chains, you know, bringing technology on refrigerators, et cetera, but also working, for example, in the, in the marketplace, we have a, a, a way that you can monetize commitment by donors, something called IFM, where we use capital markets to be able to take those commitments and bring that money out any time. So lots of innovation in different areas using the private sector to move things forward. And Andrew, your, your company, GSK, GlaxoSmithKline, um, has, has borrowed that same innovation, or at least come up with it on your own, about you know, the importance of charging for these vaccines, and which, which is largely what you, you sell. Um, and India, for example, is about 30% of your product? So India, for our total company, about a third of everything we sell in the world, we sell in India, yeah. um, which I think most people are quite shocked by because the assumption is that Western drug companies can't compete in emerging markets, you can't compete at Indian cost of goods. We manufacture most of what we sell in India in India, so you're naturally hedged against the kind of cost structure of that economy. But the reality is that you can deliver that kind of volume. As an organization, 
we're essentially made up of about 55% pharmaceuticals and the rest split evenly between vaccine and, and consumer health by revenue. By volumes, the volumes are by far skewed toward the vaccine and the consumer health business. So actually as a business, probably half our products sell for less than $10. And if you think about a vaccine, it's $10 that protects you for your whole life, which is a, a very kind of different kind of dynamic to some of the assumption of what pharmaceutical industry is about. You know, we heard this morning people talking about $100,000 for an extra month of life, which is true in certain circumstances and is valuable in certain circumstances, but it's not the whole story. And for us, we've got a kind of blend of those different businesses. But it's important because you have told me in the past that you make a, a, a profit, a tiny profit, in every market that you're in yeah. and why that's so critical. I mean, you are a public company, and I yeah. think that's uh, – certainly there's pressure from shareholders to earn more of a profit, but just the fact that you do earn that profit – is, is part right. of the model. Yeah, so, so I think there's no sustainability in doing things at a loss. And, and I think it, while donations are, are terrific in a very short-term acute situation, it's not sustainable either because it's, it's a loss, right? So you have to find a business model where everything you do within it at least covers your marginal cost. There are certain parts of our business where we, we would not necessarily be contributing towards our fixed costs as an organization, but you know, within the overall piece, it's adding to the returns of the company. Broadly speaking, the way we've tried to structure our, particularly for vaccines, is GNI per capita across the world. So we rank, literally rank order uh, the world by GNI per capita, and we drive our prices accordingly. We think Just that's like that, and right. And then yeah. Gavi essentially sits at the bottom because Gavi represents the poorest countries. It's at the very bottom of that tier, and so Gavi gets the best price in the world essentially. Uh, what that's allowed us to do is then to build – the thing you have to remember about vaccines is it takes a long while to discover a vaccine. My God, it takes a long while to build a factory to make the vaccines. Mm. So actually, when you look at the capital base required, you need certainty of volume. So one of the things that's worked very well with Gavi is market shaping, advanced market commitment, so-called, in an area, for example, pneumococcal vaccine. So Gavi decided, or the funders of Gavi decided this was a priority area. Gavi signaled to the marketplace, to people like us, if you're prepared to build capacity, there is essentially a guaranteed volume at a certain price, a low price, but a certain price. We then went forward, spent 10 years building a facility. We spent 600 million Singapore dollars building that facility in Singapore. It came on stream. It supplies vaccine to Gavi, and it's contributing to the first drop in childhood mortality in sub-Saharan Africa because for the first time those children are being vaccinated against lethal diseases. And you start to see hospitals being vacated from sick kids. They can now treat different types of patients, maybe adults with more NCD-type disease. That's the model which Gavi has helped to facilitate, but it needed companies like GSK to be prepared to engage in it. And Seth, yeah. Yeah, let me just add a little bit yeah, to, yeah. to that model because, you know, that's exactly what we were trying to do, this type of partnership, because as we drive up the volumes, it also drives down the cogs. And, and as Andrew said, if we don't amortize research costs onto the Gavi market, the price point can be quite good. This particular mechanism we used, which is advanced market commitment, we also paid a premium. So we said to the, the company, up to $1.5 billion, we would give you, if you sell the doses at $3.50, we'll give you an additional $3.50, which can go towards the cost of building that plant, go towards your shareholders and mm -hmm. amortizing some of those costs up front. And because it's a guaranteed payment, it has some incentive built in it. It's not you know, the same incentives as the U.S. market, but it allows us to work in a different way. Now, what happened with this? This vaccine came out, and, and, and initially, from the time it, it came out in the developing world, within a year, it entered its first developing country, and five years later, it's been rolled out in 54 countries. Now, we don't normally have that type of slope when new innovations come in, particularly when the price point for these vaccines is, you know, well north of $100 in, in wealthy countries. Countries. So that ability to uh, work with the companies to make sure we have a model that ultimately should mean that when a new technology occurs, it's available everywhere in the world. Now, what we haven't talked about is middle-income countries, and to make this model really work, you have to have you know, this curve that allows a higher payment in those countries as well so that the area under the curve both maximizes access as well as profit, which, of course, at the end is Ramsey pricing.
And this is the challenge in providing this kind of care to, to the developing world to, or to the least developed countries is that you can't just be sustainable, you have to also be scalable, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you, you have talked about that, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, there's no question. And if you look at GSK, we make in any given year between 800 and a billion doses of vaccine. About 70% of that vaccine, one way or the other, goes to the developing world at different, in different ways. And so it's a gigantic scale operation. We have very, Gavi's a key partner, UNICEF, others, massive partners who help deliver this vaccine. Um, and it represents a, an enormous part of the organization. If you, and, and what GSK really is when it comes to vaccines is three different business models. One is the one we've just been talking about. So how do you represent huge impact to human life on a global basis while not losing money? How do you thread that needle? Because, uh, because actually the alternative to that is to sit as the owner of a technology and turn your face away from billions of people. That's not the right thing to do. So, you know, ultimately the right thing to do is to make that technology available. The challenge is to find a way to make it economically sustainable, which is what we've just talked about. The second model is the classic, let's call it uh, developed world commercial opportunity. You come up with a brand new vaccine. It's something that people really want to get. They're prepared to pay for it. And you're able to create some kind of decent economic return. But I reiterate, the cost of a vaccination program for anybody in any disease is a fraction of the treatment costs of any of those diseases. And then the third model, which has evolved over the last decade, is biodefense. So, and yesterday, Monsef was here talking about the biodefense, the Ebola experiences. And actually, as a vaccine organization, we run all three models. And they're very, very different in the way they operate. But it's very interesting. It's made it a very interesting space to think through the various business model dimensions you need to be able to be in one minute delivering 300 million doses of oral polio vaccine, the next minute to develop the new vaccine for shingles here in America, and the next minute to respond to Ebola when Ebola cracks. And that's the kind of, that's really what our vaccine organization is. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting because uh, the penetration that you get in, your, in, the develop, in some countries, in Rwanda, for example, for uh, the, uh, you know, for the HCV vaccine, uh, HPV vaccine, is, is the, much higher than it would be, say, in the, develop, in the developed world, right? Tom Frieden uh, said, God, we wish we had that kind of penetration in um, HPV. Well, I mean, one of the challenges is in those countries, as I said, they need the vaccines, if anything, more. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the challenges is how do you then get that high coverage level? So Rwanda worked very hard with their schools, with their healthcare workers, and their coverage is around 92, 93 percent. You look at other countries, Japan is around 2 percent, wow. um, the U.S. 30 to 40 percent. And so I think the challenge is how do we, how do, you know, in, in, in my countries, we don't have the same type of anti-vaccine movements you see in the West because people see the diseases you know cervical cancer is the largest cancer killer of women and so people see people dying in the prime of their life slow painful deaths no other options available they want that vaccine and right. so challenge is, is is moving it forward and, and I agree completely with Andrew about this issue of we of course accept donations when there's emergencies but that's not a sustainable model and 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 coming up with these types of models over time is a way to engage and, and not just large multinational companies. What's happened with the stable marketplace is that companies from the developing world have stepped in and said it's worth now making that investment because we know that marketplace will exist for a period of time. And that's created some healthy competition, which has allowed us to get to a place where we have a healthy vaccine market. Now, you both have to deal with parts of the world that are volatile, that are in war zones. And I mean, this is where a lot of the greatest need in, you know, of, of de delivering these kinds of vaccines and healthcare. I mean, how do you deal with something like Yemen, for example, or Andrew, I don't know, is any of the countries that we're, I mean, you serve, how many countries do you? Do you well, we supply vaccine pretty much to every country in the world. Every country in the world. So uh, how do you deal with that? So, the, I mean, there's multiple questions in there. Now, part of it is our normal model is to work with governments because vaccines are usually provided by governments for their citizens. It's not a pay-for-service model. We have countries that don't have governments. What do you do in Somalia? What do you right. do in places that are in turmoil? So what we tend to do then is work with our alliance partners. We work with UNICEF or WHO to help with delivery civil society in doing that. And, and what's happened right now is the world is in a terrible place. We have more level three emergencies than ever, and, and this is going on across the world. And so one of the challenges we're having is massive disruption of populations. We're having not only internally displaced people, but refugees around the world. And how do we make sure they get vaccinated? And I think what's really important is to 
you know, a little bit shift this conversation into this issue of what does it mean for other countries. Global health security, if you think about this, I have often dinner in Nairobi, breakfast in London, lunch in New York. That's within the incubation period of most of these diseases. And so the question is, people are moving, viruses are moving, and how do we make sure to protect countries that we actually vaccinate in countries? And recently with yellow fever, for example, we've seen export of cases from Central Africa to other countries in Africa, but also to China. And yet that vaccine has been around for, you know, almost 80 years and cost a dollar a dose and gives lifetime immunity. So mm -hmm. how do we make sure that we're getting the vaccines out where they need them to protect the world's population? So in just a second, I'm going to open this up to questions. So please think of the questions uh, for these panelists. But um, Andrew, I mean, a lot of this model, you, you're a public company, you've got shareholders. Uh, what's it like to tell this message uh, hey, we can do this in the three different business models and they're synergistic and we make money, uh, but they're saying, well, why don't you give me the next, you know, you know, blowout uh, oncology drug that I, you can charge an arm and a leg for? Well, I think um, our conversation with shareholders is much more around how do we manage to create a decent return across the whole portfolio of the business over multiple years. The, the irony of the of the tension that, in fact, the panel this morning was talking about. The irony of that tension is everybody's become very fixated on very short-term returns, price, in a year. But in fact, you think about our business. In the pharmaceutical business, a typical drug development program probably takes 20 years, and the product has a 10 to 12-year pattern life on the market. So you're talking about a 30-year cycle. Ph uh, vaccines, at least 30 years, right? Mm. So. We, we sit looking at those situations. We then fixate on these incredibly short-term metrics of value from a shareholder perspective, when in fact the key is what is the return curve over the whole 30-year period. The minute you start to think about returns, you start to increase the solution space because instead of just talking about price, you're talking about volumes, you're talking about time, the value of time in all of this dynamic. If you think about volumes, how do you create volume? Then you have to start accessing the six billion and not just fixate on the 600. And Steve Miller was right this morning. There's no question. The US is oversubsidizing the world system. How do we take the pressure off? We think through these graduated GNI per capita uh, curves across the world, very transparently, we are super upfront with countries around, this is why we set the price at this level, because right. we think you're sat here on the income curve. It's not always a simple conversation. But it's a, very, it's a very upfront conversation. And actually, what that means is, because you've got huge 300 million people every couple of years entering the world healthcare market, they're not coming in at US price points, but they're coming in at a price point. Mm -hmm. 10 years from now, they'll have gone up a price point. And gradually, you start to see the pressure being shared a little bit across the world markets. That's, what the, that's our model. Now, the minute somebody like me is defending the economic returns in a quarter or a year on a business with a 30-year investment cycle, you're done. I mean, that's a ridiculous conversation because we don't, I don't make any decisions which are essentially a year long. I can tell you, the first CapEx decision I took was to build a new vaccine factory to make pertussis vaccine. I made that decision in 2008. The construction just finished, and it will take two years to validate with the regulators, and the first batch will come out at the end of 2019. Can you imagine making a decision, you know, in a short time frame when that's just your capital build? Right. Yeah. The world's first malaria vaccine was begun in development in 1982 and registered in 2015. <laughs> right. And that wasn't because we were slow or stupid. It's because it's super difficult and takes a long time to do these things. All right. I just, I just want to grab a question from the audience because we only have a few minutes left. We've got one over there and then um, maybe for, for Seth. Yeah. Smith, Ken Smith at the University of Utah. I'm just curious, given uh, the tremendous work that you're doing and the the uh, the countries that you're that you're uh, you're addressing their problems, these very poor countries. What is the what is the interaction or the coordination with respect to uh, one of the drivers of the of the poverty that you see in these countries, which is simple family size. And, and, and the issue of family planning, and you, you, have, you have a presence there. And so how does that coordination uh, take place with your, with your penetration around, around the globe? I'll maybe make a very quick comment, but Seth would be much more um, thoughtful on this. 
I think at the very core of this, before we get into conversations of family planning, I think, frankly, families need to believe that their children are going to survive. And, you know, as, as Seth has done, as I've done, you spend time in, in for example, Somalian refugee camps, and, and, you, and you sit with mothers who have buried all three, or three of the four children she had before she was 22, and, you know, her, and she lives in, I'm not even going to say a hut, I'm, uh, you know, she lives in a shelter which has zero man-made material in it, zero. Everything is literally gathered from the dust. Until you can change her prospects for how long her surviving child will survive or how long the next child will survive, the rest of that conversation is academic. And, but that's why fundamental engagement in vaccination, in child health, in maternal mortality, all of these, I think, are absolute precursors. Once you start to make, once you start to build that confidence, then all the other issues, all the other levers that you have to pull become critical. But we've got to, if you, you know, if you can't change that mother's confidence, you're, you're, you're literally running backwards all the time. Okay, and, and this is why we're, we're so, it's so critical. Today, we have the highest vaccine coverage ever in history. We have 86% of the kids covered with the basic vaccines. Um, but that still means that 14 percent are not. And so one of our challenges is how do we reach out to that 14 percent? And when we do that, we bring not just a vaccine. We bring a health worker. We bring a supply chain. We bring a data system. And that is what is going to be used for other interventions as well. Melinda Gates is very uh, keen to work on the problem you talk about. And her focus is on people who want contraception and don't have access and trying to reach that group of people. But as Andrew has said, as long as they think their, fa their children are going to die, they're going to continue to want to have large family sizes, and that's the first thing we have to stop. What we saw with the panel earlier about the, you know, the rise of pandemics and the, the, the sheer certainty of them, they don't recognize borders, the six billion people that we are talking about, the diseases that affect them ultimately will affect yeah. those here. Uh, we've got 30 seconds left. Who wants to grab some comment about that? Well, go ahead, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I mean, you know, we, we talked yesterday about diseases like Ebola. There's a whole range of diseases like that. And what we have to make sure is this is not a charity. What are the incentives in place to get the best technology, the best companies, not just large companies, but uh, biotech companies, academic institutions, to be prepared to step in and bring science and technology to solve these problems? I'm a great believer in science. It can solve this problem. But to do it, we have to have a set of incentives in place that will allow that to happen with proper speed and engagement. And that's what Monsef talked a little bit about yesterday today with this new project, SEPI. So that is our call to arms for digital health to, to attack this issue. I want to thank my great panelists, Seth Berkeley and Andrew Whitty. Thank, thank you, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you.